socialized to believe as men that we seek out quantity instead of quality in women. Um, and it's, it's, that, it's that, that lowering of the women's status in our minds that, that can allow some men, not all men, to do the things that we do um, that, are, that have such a, a devastating impact on, on women um, all across the world, all around the world. Um, and it's, that's all, that's all rooted in, in patriarchy. It's all rooted in, in the systems that we have in place to allow men that, to, to enjoy that privilege and for that privilege to go unchecked, uh, for sure. Um, that's everything from, from the you know, wage gap to the sexualization and objectification of women in the media uh, to the uh, extremely low distribution rates for uh, abusers and for rapists. All of those things are, sort of serve as a form of permission for men to continue doing what they're doing. And there's rarely any consequence for men who do these things, uh, either through the legal system or even socially, uh, you know, am amongst ourselves as men. Um, so I kind of wanted to share, if it was okay with you, I wanted to share a, a story um, that, that I think gets at, uh, th it's actually a story about a sexual assault, but, it's, but it gets at this larger issue of the way, the way society views women and how that creates the space for all forms of violence against women, not just domestic violence or, social, uh, or sexual violence or any of those things, but how all forms of violence uh, can exist. So if that's okay, I'd like to share a story. It's actually a story about me. Um, in, in 1992, I was a, a junior in college, and uh, I met a girl um, who was a, she was a freshman. Uh, it was her first semester of, of, uh, of college. Uh, kind of had a crush on her, um, and uh, she, we were in the same degree program uh, at, at the university. And uh, I worked up the courage to ask her on a date. And I say worked up the courage because I'm extremely shy when it comes to asking out girls. I waited and waited and waited and would hope that they would ask me out. Uh, <laughs> I was lucky in that a lot of them did. That was cool, but um, you know. Yeah, I was incredibly, incredibly nervous about it, but but this one was a little bit different, and, and I worked up the courage to ask her out on a date, and luckily she said yes. Um, her name's Holly. And um, we went out on a date, had a great time, asked her out again, and again, and again, and again, and it was obvious that things clicked with us, and that um, we, we, had a, we had a spark. And so we were out on, on one of those dates, uh, actually went to a party together, uh, there at the university, and uh, we were hanging out and having a great time, and she says, oh, I've got to go to the bathroom. I'll, I'll be back in just a minute. I'm yeah, sure, we, we all do that, right? Uh, and so I waited, and maybe 15, 20 minutes later, uh, she, she hadn't come back yet. And I thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe something's wrong, maybe something happened, I didn't know what was going on. So I found a, a, a female friend of mine and asked her to please uh, go in and, and, and check on Holly. And, so she goes over, knocks on the door, goes on in, shuts the door behind her, and I kind of waited and waited and waited, and then I could, I started to hear like a sobbing, crying, coming from from the bathroom. I, you know, immediately in my own insecurity was like, what did I do? <laughs> how did I how did I mess this up? I thought we were having a good time, you know, sort of thing. And then finally, my my friend came out and said she'd like to speak to you. You know, can you go in? And that was odd, but you know, it's so I. I I said, sure, and I went in, and, and what, what Holly told me in, in that bathroom that night literally changed my life from that point moving forward. <clears throat> Come to find out that about a month prior to um, our first date, Holly had been sexually assaulted in a fraternity house on campus uh, by a guy that she was on a, on a date with. She, they had a, uh, it was a nighttime football game that night, and so the Fraternity had a, a party earlier in the day, uh, sort of pre-game party, and she had gone to that with this guy who she just met, and uh, was on a first date with, and uh, was kind of set up by some of her friends. And she uh, went to the fraternity house, you know, they're having a good time. Uh, and this guy was giving her lots and lots of drinks. Uh, you know, everybody's having a great time. And then there was a point where she became like clearly intoxicated, uh, and it was at that point that that he sort of grabbed her by the hand and led her down to the basement of the fraternity house. And when they got there, uh, there was nothing in the room except a mattress on the floor. It was otherwise, it was empty. And that's where he assaulted her.
practice saying that over and over again. This clearly has an impact. I know this has an impact because I've been married to Holly for 15 years. And I've seen over and over and over again her relive that night. It's not always as painful as it is as it was in the moment. It's not always as painful for me as it is right now. But you see it. You see that devastation. I've only known her as a rape survivor. Only. And I got, you know, I found out more about the situation, obviously. I found out that night what I told you is that she'd been assaulted. And what I what I came to found out find out later was that immediately following the assault, she went back to her friends and she tried to tell them what happened. And they didn't believe her. They said, it's your fault, you got drunk, you shouldn't have gone with him down to the basement. All of these things are your fault. And if you want anybody to, to ever respect you again, you'll finish the date. You'll go to the football game with him. These were her friends, her best friends, guys and girls. And so she was humiliated, she was confused, she was hurt, she was still drunk. She didn't know what to do, so she finished the date. But that, that experience was so humiliating for her and left her feeling so alone, she, she couldn't, she didn't feel like she could go to the police with it, she didn't think anybody would believe her. And it hadn't come up again until that six weeks or so later when we were on that date together. And something happened, I don't know exactly what that night that triggered it for her, and she was reliving that moment while she was in the, having a great time with me. And like I say, you know, we've been married for 15 years, and, I, and I've seen that impact lessen over the years, but I can say for sure, 100%, she hasn't forgotten. And when I, when I talked about this with her, about how to, you know, how can I talk about this, she went over every little detail and said, Make sure, make sure that part's right. Make sure this part is right. Very, very painful. But what, you know, I mentioned, I mentioned privilege. And I mentioned the way that men are socialized to treat women. What I didn't mention was that women are also socialized in the same exact way. Society tells women to not love yourselves, to not love each other, to not value yourselves, value each other. We all get the same message. We, we all internalize that oppression against women in various ways. And, and the, the, what springs out of that is, is this culture that, that allows for rape and, and trafficking and domestic violence, all of these things to live and breathe and go unchecked for the most part. And of course, as Josie said, there are lots of people who are doing fantastic work around this and have been for a long, long time, particularly women, for a long, long time have been doing this work. And that can't go unnoticed, you know. And we do have to, we do have to join hands and we do have to say, we are all doing this type of work together. We, can't, we have to stop being individuals trying to do this work and become, again, once again, a movement of people who are doing this work. And I don't know that that movement ever died. I don't think it, you know, it did by any stretch of the imagination, but it became part of the fabric of society. And, and when that happens, it gets less noticed. And I think that's what happened. It just became, oh, well, yeah, there's this women's movement. That's just part of what else we have in the world. And it's time to ramp that up again, I feel. I know that there are other people who are already way out ahead of me on that, for sure. I'm not bringing anything new to that conversation. But we have to get more people involved, for sure. Oh, man, this didn't go where I wanted it to. <laughs> I'm freestyling. Um, I didn't want to tell you the details of, of her of her assault, for sure. Um, but I, I do want you to know that the only reason that that assault happened that night was because of the, the conditions we have in our society that allow that to happen. 
and, and sexual violence and domestic violence and all of these things are just symptoms of lar these larger problems of sexism and misogyny and patriarchy that we can't, we can't be silent about at all. So um, to tie that more into the type of work that I've been doing, um, Josie mentioned uh, um, uh, that, I, that I formed, um, I don't know if it's an organization or an agency or just a movement, I think it's more of a movement. I don't have a building, I, don't have, I didn't bother with nonprofit status or any other than this, because I don't think the revolution ever gets funded. Um, but I, I think that what Responsible Men was for me was an opportunity to start to interrupt some of those conversations that men are having with, with each other, with men, are, with the conversations that men are having with their sons, uh, to start to, t to bring to light some of the ways that uh, corporate America is teaching all of us that women's value lies in their sexuality and their availability sexually, uh, and to, for us to view them as sex objects. So if I can create some sort of critical consciousness around that, with, among men especially, to realize that we can't, we can't view women in that way, we can't subscribe to that, and we can't support companies that exploit women in that way to put a dollar in their own pockets. And so that's where, that's where the work of Responsible Men has, has been for, uh, since it started in 2008. Um, that's sort of my night and weekends job. Um, I work by day, fortunately, for the Texas Association Against Sexual Assault uh, as, a, as a prevention program specialist. So uh, most of my work revolves around working with youth um, but we are looking for ways to incorporate, we, we do lots of work around engaging men in sort of this type of work as well, obviously. Um, uh, but to try and bring men into this work in the right way, not as the ones who are gonna come in and save the day, but as recognizing that they can play a significant part in, in change and looking to the women who are, have already blazed that trail for the way to do that. How can men come in and support that work rather than take it over? Um, if, if men come in and try to take it over, it's, it's just replays the patriarchal system that we have in place in the first place that's causing all the problems. So we can't do that. Uh, and a lot of men try, and probably myself included. I'm not going to exclude myself. I think I probably had that knight in shining armor thing going for a while, too. And fortunately, lots of people checked me on that and, and got my head straight around it. And people continue to check me on that sort of thing, and they're going to have to uh, as, I'm, as I'm learning. Um, so I, I wanted to leave you with, with a quote uh, to kind of tie this back to this idea of what we're going to pass on to the next generation of people, uh, particularly our young men. Uh, I'm a, I have two sons, one who's seven and one who's 10 months old. Um, and my now seven-year-old, a couple of years ago at, at Father's Day, gave me probably the most poignant gift I've ever received from anybody. And I thought it was a setup. I thought my wife bought it and was like, this is from Cameron. But no, he picked this out. Uh, I didn't give him enough credit. Uh, it was a simple little metal sign about this big. And it had a quote on there that said, every father should remember that his son will follow his example, not his advice. And I've been given lots of advice up until that point. And it really made me turn that my eyes back inside and look at what kind of example was I giving. And was I talking about doing this sort of work, or was I doing this sort of work? And was I telling him that he should do this work, or was I providing him with opportunities to do this work? Even at, even at then five years old, you know? And so, yeah, that's an ongoing thing. And that's, that's, this, that's the sort of thing that we have to start doing. That's the type of work that I think can start making some change happen. It's, there, it's a small, subtle shift in what people can do, not just men for sure, but what people can do. In, the, in our daily lives that is changing that, those small conversations to get them going in the direction that we need them to go in. Um, and, the, and the other piece of that is certainly, the, the other example that I can provide for him is this example of consciousness around the world that we live in and our impact on it and in it. Um, and if, if we can make those changes, then I, I think we're certainly on the right track. Um, so. I think that's all I have to say. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for, for listening to that, and I appreciate it.